In the 1940s, Union Pacific's Big Boy was celebrated as the world's largest and most powerful steam locomotive, believed to be truly unbeatable. But behind the scenes, railroad executives authorized a secret rival, an engine so ambitious, it was meant to eclipse the Big Boy's dominance forever. Yet almost overnight, this would-be giant vanished from history. It was erased by failed promises and the diesel revolution. What happened to the forgotten engine built to dethrone a legend? And why are railroad historians still searching for answers? Union Pacific's Big Boy set a new standard for what a steam locomotive could be. Designed in the early 1940s, it was engineered to conquer the toughest mountain grades between Ogden, Utah, and Cheyenne, Wyoming, pulling heavy freight where lesser engines stalled or broke down. The numbers alone seem almost unreal, a total weight pushing 1.2 million pounds, stretching more than 132 feet from coupler to coupler. Its wheel arrangement, 4884, meant two sets of eight massive driving wheels, all powered by a single articulated frame that allowed this giant to snake through sharp curves other engines could not handle. Big Boy's boiler operated at 300 pounds per square inch, feeding steam to four cylinders, each with a diameter of 23.75 inches. That power translated to a tractive effort of 135,375 pounds, enough to pull 4,000 tons up a 1.14% grade without breaking stride. On the open plains, Big Boy could hit speeds over 70 miles per hour, but its true strength showed on the climbs where it routinely hauled 100 or more freight cars at a time. The tender alone carried over 24,000 gallons of water and up to 32 tons of coal, fueling journeys that would have left most locomotives stranded halfway up the mountain. Only 25 big boys were ever built, each one a marvel of American engineering and industrial ambition. For a decade, nothing else on rails could touch them for sheer size, power, or performance. Railroaders called it the king of steam, and for good reason. No other engine matched its combination of brute force and reliability. Any rival would have to exceed a benchmark that seemed at the time almost impossible to reach. Freight yards swelled with cars as the Second World War pushed American railroads to their absolute limits. Wartime demand sent tonnage figures soaring to levels never seen before. Between 1941 and 1945, railroads moved over 2.5 billion tons of freight, an increase of almost 50% compared to the previous decade. Every available locomotive was pressed into service, but the sheer volume of raw materials, machinery, and troops strained even the most powerful engines. Railroad accountants pored over traffic graphs and balance sheets, watching costs climb as quickly as the trains, as quickly as the trains themselves. Labor expenses rose sharply as crews worked around the clock. Each big boy required not just a skilled engineer and fireman, but teams of mechanics to keep them in working order. Maintenance shops ran at full tilt with overtime hours mounting and repair bills stacking up. Even with these giants on the rails, congestion at major terminals became a daily headache. Delays rippled across the network and any breakdown could snarl hundreds of miles of traffic. Fuel and water consumption posed another challenge. Steam engines devoured coal by the ton and water by the thousands of gallons. As coal prices edged upward and water stops limited nonstop runs, operating costs crept higher. Some routes needed double or triple heading. With multiple engines lashed together to move the heaviest wartime loads, multiplying crew and fuel costs. By the late 1940s, railroad planners faced a stark reality. The current fleet, even with the big boy at the helm, was barely keeping up. Every department from operations to finance demanded a solution. The search for a locomotive that could handle more freight, run farther between stops, and reduce labor and maintenance costs became a matter of survival for the industry. The pressure was on to find an engine that could do what even the big boy struggled to accomplish. Pressure mounted inside the boardrooms of the Pennsylvania Railroad as the 1940s wore on. Traffic demands kept climbing, 
and the numbers from the Western lines, especially Union Pacifics, could not be ignored. In 1944, the Pennsylvania Railroad Board authorized something bold, a new locomotive that could handle the heaviest wartime loads with a single engine and finally close the gap with the big boy. The order went out for a prototype, designated number 61331, to be built at Altoona Works. The directive was clear, no more double-heading, no more patchwork solutions. The mechanical department was given a mandate, design an engine powerful enough to move 125 loaded freight cars at mainline speeds, across the mountains and through the bottlenecks that choked the system every day. Correspondence from the Pennsylvania Railroad's top managers reveals a sense of urgency and ambition. Letters from the board to the mechanical department in late 1943 called for a locomotive that would not just match, but surpass anything running out west. The focus was on innovation, not imitation. Altoona's engineers were told to draw on every lesson learned from earlier duplex designs, but this time the stakes were higher. Wartime shortages, rising costs, and the looming promise of diesel technology all hung over the project. Yet the directive stood, deliver a single engine solution that could outhaul and outpace the big boy and do it on the Pennsylvania Railroad's own terms. With the prototype order in place and the board's expectations set, the challenge was now in the hands of the railroad's designers and builders. How did they plan to outdo the reigning king of steam? And what risks were they willing to take to get there? Designers at Altoona Works faced a challenge that demanded more than just brute force. They turned to the duplex drive concept, a radical departure from the articulated frames that powered giants like the big boy. Instead of hinging the locomotive in the middle, the new engine featured a rigid frame with two sets of driving wheels, arranged in a 4464 pattern. This allowed for four leading wheels, followed by two separate groups of driving wheels, four in the front, six in the center, and another four trailing. The goal was to distribute the engine's massive power more evenly, cutting down on the violent pounding that plagued single-drive locomotives at high speeds. A key innovation was the automatic slip control system. Duplex designs had a reputation for wheel slip, especially under heavy loads or on slick rails. The slip control mechanism used sensors and relays to detect when one set of drivers began to spin faster than the others. When that happened, the system automatically reduced steam to the slipping set and shifted power to the wheels with better traction. This was a first for American steam. An early attempt at making a locomotive think for itself. Starting a train of 125 loaded cars from a standstill required even more ingenuity Engineers added a booster engine to the trailing truck, providing an extra surge of tractive effort for the first few hundred feet. Once the train was rolling, the booster disengaged, letting the main cylinders take over. Every detail, from the placement of the cylinders to the routing of steam lines, was carefully calculated on the blueprints. The result was a machine that, on paper, promised to outpace and outpull anything on the rails. But the true test would come not in the drafting room, but out on the main line. Trade journals and glossy brochures painted a future where the new engine would transform railroad economics overnight. Pennsylvania Railroad executives did not just whisper about progress, they shouted it from every advertisement and press release. One bold promise stood out in oversized type. This locomotive would haul 125 loaded freight cars at 50 miles per hour across the Alleghenies with a single crew. No more double heading, no more mid-run stops for extra engines. The railroad's marketing department claimed this engine could do the work of two, maybe even three, of its predecessors, all while slashing labor costs and keeping schedules tight. Brochures handed out at industry conferences boasted of an automatic slip control system so advanced it would virtually eliminate wheel slip under any load. Trade journals echoed the excitement, calling it the most powerful steam locomotive ever static tested. 
nearly 8,000 horsepower on the Altoona test stand. The phrase unmatched efficiency appeared again and again, promising longer runs between water stops and a dramatic cut in maintenance downtime. Advertisements even suggested that the new design's smooth ride would keep crews fresher and reduce fatigue, a subtle jab at the bone-jarring pounding of older models. The railroad's own executives lent their names to these claims, signing off on full-page spreads in Railway Age and Mechanical Engineer. The message was clear this was not just another engine, but a revolution on rails, ready to outclass the big boy and rewrite the rules of heavy freight. For a brief moment, the hype was everywhere until reality caught up with the dream. Test logs from Altoona captured a headline number, 7,987 horsepower, recorded with the prototype's cylinders roaring under controlled conditions. On paper, the new engine seemed unstoppable. But as soon as it left the test stand and entered daily freight service, the story changed. Depot records from Crestline and the Western region began to tell a different tale, one measured not in peak figures, but in miles between failures, gallons of water drained, and hours lost to repairs. Crews assigned to the new engine noticed the first problem almost immediately. Water consumption soared well beyond expectations. Instead of the planned 120 gallons per mile, real-world runs logged up to 180 gallons per mile, draining the tender long before reaching the next scheduled stop. On heavy coal drags over the Alleghenies, engineers sometimes had to throttle back, not because the engine lacked muscle, but because the water gauge dropped dangerously low. The static horsepower numbers from Altoona never translated to the rails. Field tests rarely pushed past 5,200 drawbar horsepower at speed, a full 2,700 below the factory claim. Valve gear posed another headache. The innovative poppet valve design, intended for high-speed efficiency, wore out quickly under freight loads. Maintenance logs from 1946 show repeated, repeated entries for valve chatter, binding, and seat erosion. One incident in the winter of 1947 left a loaded train stranded outside Pittsburgh when a stuck valve forced a shutdown. Shop foreman grew familiar with the sight of the new engine's side panels open, mechanics wrestling with tools and replacement parts. For the railroad, these gaps between promise and practice had real consequences. The engine's reputation suffered with every unscheduled stop and every extra water fill. Numbers from the maintenance department showed availability rates hovering below 60%, far short of what was needed to justify further investment. Each logbook entry became another piece of evidence that, despite all the innovation, the engine could not deliver what the railroad had been promised. Pennsylvania Railroad's ambitious new locomotive entered a world that was already changing. The ink was barely dry on the production orders when the economics of American railroading took a sharp turn. Wartime demand had justified bold investments, but by 1945, the end of the war brought a flood of surplus engines and a sudden tightening of budgets. Procurement memos from the PRR board in early 1945 show an initial plan for over 100 units. Yet, as costs mounted and the first engines rolled out of Altoona Works, the order was slashed to just 25. The reason for the pullback was parked right on the next track. Diesel locomotives, once dismissed as unproven, were now proving themselves in daily service. Electromotive Division's F units, introduced in large numbers after 1946, offered something steam could not, higher availability, lower maintenance, and the ability to run long distances without stopping for water or coal. Internal studies from the PRR Operations Department showed diesels could stay on the rails up to 90% of the time compared to the new duplex steam engine, 60%. Crews needed less training, and the cost of keeping a diesel running was a fraction of what it took to maintain a complex, high-powered steam locomotive. Railroad executives watched as competitors like the New York Central and the Santa Fe shifted more of their mainline freight to diesel power. The numbers were impossible to ignore, 
By 1948, more than half of all new locomotives delivered to American railroads were diesels. The PRR's own procurement ledgers reflected this pivot. Diesel orders climbed while steam projects stalled or were quietly canceled. The forgotten Challenger, built with the hope of outpacing the big boy, found itself squeezed by market forces it could not overcome. Its production run ended almost as soon as it began, not because of a single design flaw, but because the world it was built for had already moved on. By the early 1950s, the last of the so-called Challenger engines were already vanishing from the rails. Diesel power swept across the country, and with it came a new era, one that had little patience for the complexity and cost of massive steam locomotives. Official records from the Pennsylvania Railroad and other major lines show a clear pattern. Engines that could not match the new standards for efficiency were pulled from service, lined up in storage yards, and quietly sold for scrap. Between 1952 and 1955, nearly every example of these ambitious steam giants was cut up. Their steel frames and intricate machinery reduced to raw material for the next industrial cycle. No fanfare, no preservation plans, just a line item on a disposal ledger and a few faded photographs in railroad archives. Yet the story did not end with the torch. In 2022, an unexpected rediscovery reignited interest in these forgotten machines. While sorting through a lot at a Midwestern estate auction, a restorer named Daniel Brooks came across a heavy brass builder's plate. The serial number and stamped date matched records from a scrapped Pennsylvania Railroad duplex, a model once rumored to have been built to outdo the big boy. The plate bore the unmistakable marks of Altoona Works, dated 1945, and carried the faded outline of the engine's original number. Brooks traced its journey through handwritten receipts and salvage yard inventories, eventually confirming its authenticity with the Pennsylvania Railroad Technical and Historical Society. Archival documentation linked the plate to one of the last Q2 duplex locomotives dismantled in 1955. Shipping manifests and salvage orders revealed that entire classes of these engines were broken up at the Crestline and Conway yards, their parts scattered across the Midwest. The builder's plate had survived decades of obscurity, passed from one collector to another before resurfacing as a tangible link to the lost era of steam. For historians and enthusiasts, the artifact offered more than just proof of survival. It was a rare piece of evidence that these engines, once written off as failures, still left their mark. The rediscovery sparked new archival searches and brought the story full circle, connecting the vanished giants of the steam age with the present day through a single weathered piece of metal. Today, the legend of unbeatable machines endures, but history proves that even the boldest engineering can vanish overnight in the face of disruptive change. As railroads accelerate toward automation and cleaner energy, the real race is not size or power, it is adaptation. Forgotten giants remind us that innovation alone is not enough. Timing and vision shape what survives. The future of progress is always up for grabs. What is your take? Drop a comment below.